Hello and welcome to the Brands of Gloves Plant Company. Uh, my name is Carl O'Neill, I'm the Propagation and Technical Manager here and I'm also the current IPPS uh, President for the year. This is uh, I think the fourth and final virtual tour of the season and I'm delighted to, to show you around uh, on a mini tour. Uh, you're much more welcome in person to come around and, and uh, have a look around and ask lots of questions. But I'll try to do my best to give you the best virtual tour I can and at the end of it all if you could ask Obviously, as many questions as you want in, uh, in the session on Zoom in a few weeks. Okay, right. thanks. Brands Plant Company, we are based in Worcestershire, uh, the, under the foot of the Morgan Hills, and we grow approximately 1.7, 1.8 million plants uh, that we sell to the garden centre industry uh, all across the UK, right to the north of Scotland and down to the south of Cornwall and in the southeast. We, our customer base is made up of about eight or nine, eight or 900 different customers. Uh, about 50% of our sales go to the, to the larger groups, uh, including people like Waitrose, uh, Conlike and Stripes and Nobbies, and the other 50% is very much to independent garden centres. We aim to sell primarily promotional products, so, so uh, products where we offer a lot of uh, marketing support, so whether it's through very good labelling or, or uh, cause to go with it or a campaign to go with that plant, and we aim to, to churn out quite a high volume of any one line. And uh, be, be real, the real impulsy sort of wow factor uh, purchases in the garden centre. Uh, of the 1.7, 1.8 million plants we sell, we are a hebe specialist and we grow about 350,000 hebes, but we also do about 120,000 hellebores, and then a mixture then of herbaceous perennials, shrubs, and climbers. Okay, uh, we, have, we are a 15 hectare site, approximately 10 hectares of that is protected space. Uh, that we cover with about three hectares of grass and the rest being tunnels. Uh, we employ 50, 50 to 55 permanent staff and then about the same again during the season we make more temporary staff so we do peak out and over under staff in, in the busy season. Uh, we propagate approximately 40% of what we sell uh, which is uh, very good for the business and it's very secure for the business, it keeps us in control of what we do we won't ever get to 100% because we introducing new plants to the industry is, is, is the lifeblood for us and something our customers come to expect uh, on a regular basis. Every year we can introduce 19, 20 new introductions and we still ask for what's new and what's, and what's new coming through. So it's always, as a propagator, that's a challenge. It also means we can't grow everything because we don't have the license or the uh, and paying royalties on the things we buy. Okay, so what we're going to focus on today is our heavy production. We're stood in here now in the middle of November and all the hebes for 2022 on the ground and we're in the middle of propagating all the hebes for 2023. So at the end of this first clip we will cut and then we'll move and go through all the different stages of the hebe production from stock plant production through to cuttings, the weaning of the cuttings, the following stage and then back into the final crop that we, uh, that we produce and I'll also talk a little bit about the crop protection uh, lens that we go to and uh, our ever increasing biological reliance uh, on the crop protection. Okay, so thank you and see you in a minute. Hello again. Uh, I'm now in one of the, the, the uh, Hebe houses where we house some of our Hebe stock plants. So uh, we grow approximately 40 varieties of Hebe that we propagate in house. There are other varieties that we buy in. Uh, we do uh, sell them a, a range of Adenda Hebe, we buy those in, sell them later in the year, but most of the Hebe we grow for spring and summer sales are grown and propagated here. Uh, all, of the, all of the cutting material comes from stock that we grow in-house, either as a uh, purpose-grown uh, final plant that we destroy and, and we harvest all of the cuttings from the plant, or it's something where it's actually a byproduct of the uh, final trim plant to, to bulk up the plant ready for sales. So we're in a batch here of her E.B. Merlot memories, and this is very typical of uh, of how we collect our stock material and where we grow them. We believe that keeping all the material clean and growing them with their contemporaries, so growing them with their, 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 uh, the sale crop means we're growing them with the cleanest possible crop we can and we put all the work into it and the juvenility of the crop is very, very good and the cuttings are very, very clean and juvenile and, and all ready to go. So on one of these Hebe Merlot memories, for instance, we would expect to yield 40 to 50 cuttings off a plant like this. So it doesn't take so many plants to get up to uh, the target of 14, 15,000 of this variety. Uh, and then, so when we come through, we will completely chop it off at the base, avoiding the weed, obviously, 
chopping off at the base and, and you'll get taken straight through to the, uh, to the cuttings team. We work very hand to mouth with our cutting supply and our stock supply. We don't put things into cold storage, uh, A for disease prevention with the hebes, but we want to keep the water deficit to an absolute minimum. So generally the hebe cuttings will spend no more than an hour or two off the plant before they're cut and stuck and put under the mist unit and we find this massively increases rooting percentage take uh, before we get them in, into the mist. So what we'll do now is, you've seen the plant, but if we can move through to the, uh, to the propagation area, you can then see these being cut and taken in and then, and then put into the mist unit. Okay, thank you. Hello, we, we're now uh, joined the cuttings team, the propagation team, and uh, we have a team of six, a table for six people that we operate. Uh, we're busy all year round, uh, but this is a key season for us. So October through to December, we take 300,000 Hebe cuttings. Uh, it's very, very busy and uh, it's where the crux of the work is done. Having the Hebe's in our range like this is fantastic. It does really uh, pack out the back end of the other propagation, whereas it could be slightly quieter otherwise. And, uh, and then the spring is our other key period through April, May and June, where we, we, we churn another sort of four or 500,000 cuttings through that period. So, we just left you next door when we were looking at the Hebe Mellow Memory stock plants and they've come through within the last hour and we have Karen here who's, who's cutting up the Hebe Mellow Memories and, uh, and sticking the cuttings. So we'll, obviously Karen will be looking at these, uh, looking, looking out for any pest and disease issues that we have going on uh, and just looking for the juvenility and trying to get an even grade all the way through which really aids uh, rooting speed and, and the evenness of rooting. We don't use rooting hormone on anything we grow here. I, uh, I firmly believe if you get the right juvenility, uh, the right crops, and, uh, and the right environment to grow them in, and the right skills to, um, to take the cuttings, <clears throat> that we don't, don't, we don't need to use hormone here. In fact, for hebes, I find it slightly inhibits rooting and can, and can damage the stems. Also, there are some varieties that are very tricky to root that do, that having rooting hormone does age you, uh, but, and nothing we grow here I, do I think really needs it. So Karen will be chopping these up and we'll be aiming for taking sort of three to four hundred of these per hour uh, and we run a team of six so we have got a capability of doing sort of 10, 12,000 a day and hitting sort of 40, 40 odd thousand a week depending on, on other jobs we have to do. So these won't spend much time at all uh, off, the, off the mother plant, the parent plant, to reduce water deficit time. And uh, so Karen will be sticking these, and within the half, half an hour to an hour that we put into the mist units, so they'll be fully supported. And uh, if we move straight through to the mist unit now, you can follow me through, and then uh, I can show you where they're going. Thank you, Karen. We're now into the mist unit. Apologies if it all fucks up, because it can be a little bit like that in here. Uh, so this is a very, very busy time for us. If you look behind me, you see many, many Hebe cuttings hitting the ground now. Uh, the Hebe generally take Ooh, anything between two and four weeks to start rooting. We root everything in, uh, all the hebes get rooted in a fertile plug. In our, in our own, well, not really our own mix, we simply we dictate through and they generally, generally get stuck. We use these rather than our own, pre, um, our own loose fill because they're much, much easier to handle through the potting stages afterwards. Much more flexibility on weaning times and how we move them out and a much cleaner process for the mist unit. We don't get any loose compost or soil across the beds um, and they just work very well for us. We've been using them for many years. I've tried different plugs. We use a lot of Jiffy Preformer plugs for, for other types of cuttings but not generally for the Hebe's. We find these to work, to work really well. Uh, the Hebe Mellow memories have just taken. We can go down and see them. They've only just started the batch. Uh, chapter one of our own seedlings is Hebe Mellow Memories. We've introduced of our own seedlings now, I think about 12 in the last four or five years. And they've proven uh, highly successful. Mellow Memories is part of our red white range. Uh, there'll be Ruby Fork, Carrot Crush, and Burgundy Blush, which have been really successful since introduced four or five years ago. Here's the, here's the mellow memories that Karen and the team are working on at the moment. Uh, as I say, there's about 14, 15,000 of these to take, and uh, I expect these to be starting uh, to be these to be taken off the mist within about three weeks uh, and moved out into a cool glass house, frost protected but cool, and but, but with a maximum ventilation for disease prevention, for airflow, for, for reducing downy mildew primarily, and uh, fungal leaf spots. Okay, so in here, the beds are heated to 18 degrees, and we have, obviously on a beautiful sunny day like today, the automatic shading will probably kick over in the next sort of, uh, maybe half an hour to an hour, 
predict. Uh, all the mist operates on uh, a, a solar sensor in the roof. I watch and control the mist uh, quite closely on all, on all the varieties. When they come in, they'll have a certain level, but once they've regained uh, or, or they've maintained what I call their turga pressure, so the pressure of the water from uh, within the cell wall, and so once they've regained that, I'll reduce the mist right down for the, maybe after four or five days, and then maybe another four or five days later, I'll reduce it again, so, it's, so it gets lighter and lighter. So the weaning process really starts for me from the moment they regain turga pressure, and then after number 10 days to two weeks, they start putting the first tiny little uh, root initials out, and then after three weeks they're generally hitting the side of the plug and they're ready to move on. I like to move hebrids on as fast as I can for disease prevention. Uh, some varieties have got a little bit more tolerance, you could leave them in here for a little bit longer if you want them to be a bit further on in their rooting process, but we don't feel, we, we, we don't feel that we have to this time of year with most hebrids. Because in the summer, they'll be under slightly more stress if I move them off uh, as early as I do now, but it works very well for the reeds. We would expect 99 to 100% root intake. The very highly successful uh, rooting percentage, and it's all about the juvenility and the quality of the stock plants, which we, we work, work very hard at keeping clean here. Okay, if you've got any more questions about the rooting, and that has been whistle stop, please ask at the end of the at the end of the tour, and I'll be happy to uh, to answer them. Or if not, just email me and phone me, and I'll, I'll happily take you round. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, we've now moved out into uh, the cool glass house where we wean all our heavy plants for the winter months. So the first uh, hebes get taken in, in September, late September, but the majority are done in October and November. And as they root, after three to four weeks in the mist unit, they get moved out into, into this environment, which instantly cools them right down. Uh, the ventilation's increased hugely. We've cooled down to sort of 60-70% humidity in here compared to the 95-100% we have in the mist unit, uh, which massively helps uh, disease prevention. Uh, so, and it hardens them off for the winter months. The, the life of these plants now, if you look down on this batch here, this is Hebe Heartbreaker, this was, and this is Hebe Golden Pixie. These were moved out uh, approximately three weeks ago. So you can see now the root development has, has carried on quite strongly over the last few weeks. Uh, and they've, and, and they, they do prefer being in the cooler conditions. The Heartbreaker in particular could be uh, vulnerable to downy mildew. So having them in the much drier environment with a breeze and all the fans going that you can hear in the background, really massively helps uh, keep our disease prevention and reduces our reliance on fungicides to keep them clean. So it's a, it's a very good cultural way of keeping everything clean. So the future of these little ones is these are 2023's uh, Hebe sales for the spring 2023. So these will now sit and harden off over the winter and then come early January, uh, they'll have all their heads chopped off, pinched out to about here to encourage them to break from the base and then uh, come March through to the end of April, all of our 300,000 hebes get potted into the liner house onto effort sand beds, and they will grow on for uh, six months till August, September, and then get potted again onto the, onto, in, into the larger glass house, onto the nursery, where they will grow on over the, over the autumn, winter, ready to be sold in the spring of 2023. Okay, during that time they have obviously lots of different trims. Uh, many of the trims we do on the Hebe crops is done with a supercut machine, a tr trimming machine. We still are reliant on a lot of hand trimming, but, this, but, but the trim machine I would say does 80% of our trimming, the other 20% just as more of a grading and not all Hebe's behave themselves and grow up right and, and uh, are able to go through the machine. But some of them will get three or four trims on the machine and then one final one by hand to tidy them up. Okay, we'll move up now through the liner house to show you an example of some of our Hebe liners and then we'll go through to the final crop at the end to see what, the, see what the, this little man will look like in uh, 12 months time. Okay, thank you very much, see you in a minute. Hello, here we are uh, in the liner house. So all of our hebes, well, 80% of our hebes are all grown uh, either through the final stage or in the liner stage on effort sand beds. Uh, again, this is to uh, reduce the humidity and the, and the need for overhead watering, which reduces disease incidence or disease pressure from particularly from downy mildew, but also fungal leaf spots. Uh, and 
this is Hebe Pink Fizz, and this is no exception. It's been, it can be, if you're growing on mass like this, a little bit vulnerable to, uh, to downy mildew. So with this crop, as you'll see, we also check a board in their trays, which, really, which massively increases ventilation. We only do this over the autumn months, uh, because that's when the downy mildew can be really quite prevalent, so it does really help. It's a very good culture way of uh, disease control. I know it has a space implication, but very much worth it. But this, this is the only crop we do this with. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is actually this is actually a heavy crop that falls in between the cycle of the other ones. This is one that we keep over, and we want to sell in May, June, in full flower. All of the other hebes that you would have seen, we aim to sell in January, February, and March, with foliage colour being their predominant selling, their unique selling point. When garden centres are slightly short of colour in the centres. So yes, they have bulbs and they have hellebores in, which we obviously sell other hellebores, but they are looking to fill all the spaces within centres with uh, crops, A, to replace all their, all their Christmas displays, but they are looking to fill all their benches with crops of interest and colour for that time of year. And the range of Hebe colours that we have, from the pinks, the clarets, the purples, the reds, to the glaucous blues and the greys, uh, really fulfil that uh, part, part of the benches. Once we get into sort of May, June, the demand can decrease a little bit simply because, uh, they, yes, they come into flower, but they are competing against a lot of flowering herbaceous and a lot of other shrubs that come online at the time and may have a different season of interest to, to hebes. But certainly that sort of January to March period is key for us, and that's when most of them come out. Hebe Pink Fizz is an incredibly uh, floriferous hebe that we sell through May and June, absolutely smothered in bud and flower, and it stands, it stands on its own for the amount of flower that it has. But this is just an example. Of, uh, of, of the hebes, to, uh, the hebes in a line of crop for us that, that, that we take on to the next stage. So when these, the main crop would get potted in August and September, ready for sale in uh, January and February, and I'll t I can take you through to see those now, and we can have a little bit of discussion about crop protection. We're now in the uh, final stage of the Hebe production cycle. We're in one of the final glass houses. Again, everything's on uh, sand beds, and we're over a batch of uh, Hebe Caledonia that is due to go out in early January, generally these go out. And if you have a look across the crop, you can actually see they've come to flower. They have sort of two, two flowering periods uh, through this production cycle. The main one would be in May and June, but in this cycle they do start flowers through the autumn. Uh, they can, it can cause a little bit of a tritis issue if the flowers start going over, but we think these will hold in the main quite nicely through to January and uh, they, these will be all good to go. So these, like this plugs uh, that you've just seen next door and the cuttings, were taken 12 months ago as a cutting and gone through exactly the same production process. So it's roughly a sort of 15, 16 month production process from, from propagation through to the final plant going out uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the January, February. Evies are can be vulnerable to pest and diseases. Uh, particularly with the loss of Exemptor last year, so uh, with so the, the last grown media incorporated insecticide that we lost for, for this year, it's provided a challenge for us, particularly not on a vine weevil, not from a vine weevil perspective, more from aphid perspective, uh, but we have managed to deal with that biologically very, very well. We have been uh, practicing integrated pest management and crop management for many, many years now, so 15, 20 years, but I would say it's really ramped up in the last five to 10 years, and this last year it's ramped up even, even further with the loss of Exemptor, which has, uh, which has really made us have to uh, control pretty much everything from top to bottom with biologicals. So most of our pest uh, control, particularly under protection, is done with biologicals. So we apply uh, many parasitic, a combi combination of parasitic wasps and we apply uh, lacewing larvae through, through crops, we apply uh, lots and lots of spider mite control, thrips control of different types, we have three or four different key things that we use for thrips control for instance and we also use through the season the big master roller traps to take out uh, main fly-ins of uh, thrips and white fly. And it all works very, very well. And very rarely do we have to go for any, any insecticides. We're not organic and we don't pretend to be organic. It's just we want to do things sustainably that we can grow for the future.
a disease perspective, we do have a, we do have a crop protection uh, fungicide programme, but actually it's predominantly made up now of, there are some fungicides that we apply, but very few now in our, in our cycle. It's predominantly made up with uh, biofungicides, so Serenade and Amino X at the moment, and also there was a new elicitor came onto them, uh, came out last year, 2020, called Phytosave, which elicits a response in the plant when triggered. And so we've been using those quite heavily and we can do many, many trials on uh, its use, how to use it correctly, predictive modelling of when we think uh, disease pressure is going to be highest. And it's proven very, very successful in keeping uh, downy mildew, uh, powdery mildew, and botrytis at bay in, in combination. We do use some conventional uh, fungicides, but we do spread them out. And only really if we need to do a curative spray on one particular crop rather than a blanket spray on everything. Another big factor in disease control through our heathen crops is actually is variety selection. So when we do our own seed, raise our own seedlings or we trial any new plants coming through, they go for very strict and stringent testing and any instance of disease, despite the uh, e-program we're giving them, they get eliminated from the trial. No matter how attractive they look or, or whatever unique point of sale they might have, we will eliminate them from the trial if we think they are particularly vulnerable to any one disease because we feel that it's not sustainable to keep introducing varieties that are going to have a reliance on fungicides in the future. So we're trying to bring that out. And we have come to a point, there are quite a range of some of our hebes now that we're trying to do this year where we're doing a no-spray trial. So they haven't had any crop protection application at all. And we're eight months in now, and some of those varieties are still, well, all of them are still spotlessly clean, the ones we've selected. So that's going very, very well. And that's where we think a little bit more of the future lies for us in combination with some biofungicides. Bio uh, with peat usage, uh, obviously there's massive pressure in the UK at the moment to reduce the amount of peat, whether you agree with it or you don't agree with it, and there's many different arguments either way, and whether the peat alternatives are as environmentally or more environmentally friendly than, than, than peat is up for debate, and many people will debate either way or the other. However, the reality in this country is the big media and social media movement to get peat uh, removed from production. It is very, very challenging because at the moment, obviously, the raw materials have to be there of other products for us to do that. But we, our hand has been forced slightly, but also voluntarily for quite a few number of years. We've been using peat-free uh, mixes uh, in lowish numbers, in, in trial numbers, some things completely peat-free. But in 2021, we have been sort of quite vastly peat-reduced. So we're now down to using 40% peat in all of our, in, in all the mix we've used to use sort of 75, 80% peat, we're now down to 40% peat with 40% wood fibre and, and then bark makes up the rest and we are aiming to move to 100% peat free within, uh, within a time frame, I'm not going to put a time on it because who knows and who knows what challenges we're going to face because we don't know which source of materials is going to be the best one to use. But we are trying many different things but all the time and we have been for many years, it's just been accelerated this year with a poorer peat harvest last year anyway which forced our hand a little but also the step to move things forward. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I can hear some music in the background, uh, <laughs> we'll have to ignore that. If you've got any more questions about anything we've done here at Bransford, uh, anything we do here at Bransford, it's been a complete whistle stop tour. Normally when I talk, I can talk for England and I'll go on for hours and I'd love to do tours around the nursery, but feel free to ask as many questions as you like, because we've only touched a tiny proportion of the nursery, but I've got to sort of squeeze it into 20, 20 odd minutes. So thank you very much for listening and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you.